something good. They're eating the bad insects, okay? Some of them are going to be pests, and some of them we just don't know. We don't know if they're pests or not. They're out there. We see them. Are they causing us any economic damage? We really don't know. That's one of the things that my program is going to seek to address. Some of these insects that we're kind of curious about, well, they're in the field. Are they actually causing us an economic problem? That's what we want to try to figure out. So as I sit in my office here in Tifton and I think about insect management and I think about growers and what challenges growers face and what we can do from the standpoint of research and extension here at the University of Georgia to help growers, we're trying to help growers make more money, right? So what can we do to optimize insect management, help them with their efficiency in insect management so they can make more money? Well, I think about what are some of these challenges and I say, well, we've got lots of potential pests that eat peanuts. If you look at a list of insects that feed on peanuts, it's a long, as long as your arm. But guess what? In any given field, on any given year, we're not going to see most of those. We've got a lot of pests in some years. We won't see them in the whole state of Georgia, and then we'll have outbreak years, and we'll have lots of them. Sometimes we'll have a pest in one field, and across the road it won't be there, so they're sporadic. What does that mean to a grower? Well, it's good that we don't have a pest that's in every field every year, because that means we'd be spraying for it every year. But it's bad because growers can't plan. It makes it very difficult to figure out what am I going to do in 2014 for insect management because I don't know what my insect pests are going to be. Am I going to have lesser corn stalk borers in 2014? I don't know. Am I going to have burrow bug in 2014? I don't know. So that makes it difficult. What makes it even more difficult, and this is one that is very important, economic thresholds. For most of the pests that we have in peanuts, we don't have valid economic thresholds. It's almost hard to believe. It's 2014. Most of our crop pests and most of our major commodities, we have economic thresholds. But when you go in a peanut field and imagine you see a bunch of three-cornered alfalfa hoppers, do I spray them or not? I don't know. We don't have a valid economic threshold. So that's the problem. That's one of the things that we want to address in, in our research here at the University of Georgia. Another big problem, so I got some insects and I want to kill them. Look in the Ag Chem Manual, our pesticide handbook. For a lot of our key pests in peanuts, you'll see there's one or two insecticide options. That's not very many. On top of that, a lot of times those products don't work all that well. So we've got some key pests that have very few insecticide options and then some of those things don't work so well. So I'm not a, an insecticide chemist, so there's not much I can do about bringing new products to the market, but that's one of the challenges our growers face. So one of the first things that I was asked to do when I came on board at the University of Georgia in June of 2013 was to go down to Panama City and talk to the 2012 Peanut Achievement Club winners. This is made up of the top yielding peanut growers in the state. Some of you may be in this room. I've been a peanut entomologist for maybe three weeks and I gotta go talk to the top yielding peanut growers in the state. What am I gonna tell those people? Up until three weeks ago, I was a vegetable entomologist. They don't wanna hear about vegetables. So what I decided to do was ask these people some questions. I figure these guys can tell me more than I can tell them. So I asked them some questions. And I'm not going to share all those with you today, but some of it I think is pretty insightful. I asked these guys to rank for me the most economically important pest on their farm. So I'm new here. I want to know what you think is the most important pest on your farm. Somebody, agents who saw this yesterday, y'all don't say anything. Somebody yell out. What do you think is number one economically important pest of peanuts in the state of Georgia? Somebody say something. Help me out. Thrips. Somebody said that I would have guessed it was thrips. 2013 was a major thrips year, right? Growers have got to be concerned. Thrips got to be number one. No, it wasn't. Corn earworm and tobacco budworm. I scratched my head about this. We're going to talk about this in a second. And you'll figure out what's going on here. It's like surely that can't be number one, but that's what they listed as number one. Number two, three-cornered alfalfa hopper. This is one I just told you. We don't have economic threshold. We don't even know what the damage is from this thing. Growers perceive this as being our number two most economically important pest. What is going on? Number three, burrow bug. This is one we've all heard about. We'll talk a little bit more about it in a minute. Burrow bug, for the growers who had it, they listed it number one. But a lot of growers don't have it, and so it averaged out at being number three. Lesser corn stalk borers, that's a scary one came in at number four, and then thrips was number five. Thrips, I thought it'd be one or two, no, number five, and then corn rootworm, and finally spider mites and wireworms tied for number seven. All right, so look at this list. 
And what I want to do today is in the time we've got left, we're going to go through these top three on the growers list. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about their biology and a little bit about where management practices stand in peanuts as we go into 2014. But one of the other questions I asked growers, and this kind of illuminated that number one, how, how corn earworm and tobacco budworm came to be number one. I asked them, how many acres of your farm get treated for corn earworm or caterpillar pests annually? Over 70% of the acres in Georgia in this survey get treated for caterpillar pests every year. How many acres of, pe of peanuts in Georgia do you think are actually at threshold every year? I think it's a lot less than that. But growers are spending money controlling caterpillars, so that's why it's number one, because we're buying insecticide. And I think that's the same thing with three-cornered alfalfa hoppers. We're treating them. We don't really know if they're causing us yield loss, but we're spraying them, and so that's why it's number two. And then we'll talk a little bit more about burrow bug in just a minute. So key insect pests and some of the management options that we have for them in Georgia. So corn earworm and tobacco budworm. We've got a really good threshold for corn earworm and tobacco budworm. We've had it for a long time. It's validated, it's good. It's four to eight larvae per row foot. But it depends on the condition of the plant. So if we've got nice, green, lush growing plants, we err towards the high end of that threshold. So we can, we can tolerate eight caterpillars per row foot. And I'm gonna tell you, you go in the field and you shake some plants and you get eight caterpillars per row foot, it's gonna make you nervous because that's a lot of caterpillars. Peanuts can tolerate it. If we've got stress conditions, some drought stress, plants aren't growing so good, we might want to go down to the low end of that threshold, four caterpillars per row foot, okay? So let's say we've got some caterpillars, we hit threshold, what are we gonna do? What are our control options? First of all, we've got a bunch of broad spectrum materials that we can choose from, things like orthene, which is acephate, pyrethroids. Let me stop here for a second. I imagine all of you growers know this, but I'm gonna say it because I don't wanna take anything for granted. Don't use pyrethroids if you have tobacco budworm. All right, it wasn't that many years ago, you could go in a peanut field and if you found a caterpillar that looked like a corn earworm, you could rest assured it was probably a corn earworm. Well, guess what? You can go in your peanut field now and find a caterpillar that looks like a corn earworm and it might be a tobacco budworm. And what happens if you spray a pyrethroid on a tobacco budworm? Nothing. You're gonna spray them again with something else because it won't kill them, okay? So you wanna make sure that you know what the pests are. Identify the pest, okay? Does everybody know how to identify, tell the difference between a corn earworm and a tobacco budworm? No, okay, we're not gonna go there today, but we need to know. If you don't know, go to the county office and have your county extension agent look at them because they know. Problem with these broad spectrum materials is that they can result in secondary pest outbreaks. How many growers in this room would trade a caterpillar infestation for a spider mite infestation? Not me. <laughs> I bet not any of you either. So we gotta be careful. I'm not saying don't use these, I'm saying be careful. Uh, more selective products are things like endoxicarb or steward. Uh, Spinosad, black hawk, and then the most selective would probably be a product like Belt. These are products that are not gonna kill your, your uh, natural enemies. You're not gonna have the problem with the secondary pest outbreaks with these products. Corn earworm is a real pest. It can do something so like this, which is compensate for a heck of a we, lot of foliage we be feeding. Careful. We've got thresholds. But if we're treating at sub-threshold populations, guess what? It ain't saving you money, it ain't making you money, it's costing you money. So what we need to do is I'd much rather see us scouting our peanuts more thoroughly and not just throwing insecticide in the tank because look, look, I know it's easy. We're spraying fungicides. We can throw some worm material in the tank and we can sleep. We don't really feel like we need to scout. You can save yourself some money by scouting these fields and only treating when you're actually at threshold. Some other caterpillars that you might see and you might want to be uh, concerned about is granulate cut worms, soybean loopers. I think we're spraying a lot of soybean loopers in Georgia when we don't need to. Bean army worms and fall army worms, velvet bean caterpillars. I put this up here because you are rarely gonna have one species of caterpillar in a peanut field. You're gonna go in the field and you're gonna find some caterpillars. But there's gonna be all different kinds. And when you decide what insecticide you're gonna use to spray on them, you need to think about what's gonna kill most of these things. Because let me tell you, if you spray a pyrethroid, you're not gonna kill soybean loopers, okay? So if they're there and that's what you wanna kill, don't spray a pyrethroid. You need to think about what's out there. You need to make sure you identify the pest species that are present. Use something that's gonna kill most of them, okay? 
three-cornered alfalfa hopper. So this insect is one that we don't have an economic threshold for. If you get on the internet, you look up three-cornered alfalfa hopper, you might find a, an article from Florida that gives you a threshold of some number of insects per foot. That threshold has not truly been validated scientifically. So where we are right now is if you go into the field and you see three-cornered alfalfa hoppers flying up everywhere, what do we do? We tend to spray them, okay? Uh, that's not a scientific threshold. We don't know really what these things are doing and how much yield loss we might be having because of them. But what we do know is there are more three-cornered alfalfa hoppers now than there were probably 10 years ago, and we don't know why. Steve Brown, Dr. Brown, did some work before he became an administrator, and he very clearly showed that three-cornered alfalfa hoppers have preferences for different peanut varieties. Problem is, we don't grow any of those varieties anymore, and so we don't really know the varieties we grow right now, which ones are more susceptible to three-cornered alfalfa hoppers. So this is a question, another question that we're very interested in, in addressing. One thing that we think, we think that the immatures may be more damaging than the adults. And what that leads us to is like, okay, we've got some adults moving into the field in midsummer. Maybe if we treat those low populations of adults, we'll get them before they lay eggs and we won't have the immatures in the field. Uh, that's an idea. We don't know if that's accurate or not. That's another thing that we want to study and look at and see if that's something that we need to be doing. The big question that growers have is, do I need to treat? And if I do, when, right? And that's a, that's a major concern. It's something that we want to try to figure out. One thing that we do know based on Dr. Brown's work and, and David Adams' work is once you get within 30 days of digging your peanuts, you don't need to treat for this insect. If, it's, if you're 15 days from harvest and you go out there from digging and you go out there and there's three corn alfalfa hoppers everywhere, just ignore them. Don't worry about it. It's going to be okay. Uh, control options. Look at this. Okay, we talked about broad spectrum insecticides. Here we are. We don't have any soft chemistries for this insect. So if we decide to spray, guess what? We're setting ourselves up for some secondary pests. So if we don't have to spray it, we don't want to. Okay, does that make sense? Uh, we can kill it, but we do set ourselves up for some problems down the road if we have to treat for it. This is what the damage looks like. I hope y'all can see this okay. What that insect will do is he'll stick his mouth parts in the stem and he'll walk around it and feed all the way around that stem and he sucks the juices out and that stem will swell up and have that callus tissue like that. Here's a more recent feeding. It's like he girdled the stem, but it hasn't swollen up yet. So it's not hard to imagine, this is down there close to the ground, that you may get some white mold or something in there. What, what's going on here? You know, it's, it's hard to say. We had a, a LEP test this year, a Caterpillar trial, tons of three-cornered alfalfa hopper, lots of this girdling. Peanuts still made about 6,000 pounds, so I don't know what they're doing. Um, if, if, if they were causing a yield loss, I'd love to see what the peanuts would have done if they hadn't been there. Uh, but that's one, again, that's something we're very interested in looking at. Burrow or bug? I'm going to try to wrap us up and keep us on time here. Burrow or bug? I know if y'all grow peanuts, if you're in the peanut industry over the last five, six years, you've heard a lot about burrow or bugs. This is a kind of a scary insect, and you can think of it as a stink bug that lives in the ground. It's not exactly like our stink bugs that feed on cotton, but it's pretty close. And it basically does the same thing. It's got a piercing, sucking mouth part. It looks like a hypodermic needle. It'll stick that mouth right into a peanut pod, stick it into the kernel, and suck the juice out of the peanut kernel. Problem is, is it doesn't take very much of that kind of damage to cost us a lot of money. So if you look at the USDA grade for peanuts, when you get over 2.5% damaged kernels, you go from seg one to seg two. This is, a, this is huge. You go from making money to not making money with three kernels out of a hundred. That's why we, this insect is so scary, okay? Not only that, but it does increase the risk of aflatoxin. And there's a lot of things we don't know about this insect, especially here in Georgia, but some of the things we do know are the conditions that it likes. It really likes it dry, okay? So do we see any burrow bugs in 2013? I didn't see one. Uh, we had some reports of one or two around the state, but I never saw any, and I don't think damage was very high at all with all the water that we had. So they like drought, they like light sandy soil, and they like us to leave them alone. If you turn your peanut land, you probably will not have burrow bug. Now that's not to say you absolutely will not, but you probably will not. You will certainly reduce your risk. If you have irrigation, burrow bugs tend not to be an issue. Although I have talked to people who turn their land and have center pivots and they have had some burrow bug damage, so you can't completely rule it out. Again, this is a very sporadic insect. It'll be in one field and not another. It'll be on one farm and not another. One county will have more than another. Uh, but when it's there, it's a major problem. And for growers that have it, it is number, 
it's public enemy number one. Uh, so we're going to be looking to do some work on burrow bug. This is what the damage looks like. It's, it can be quite nasty. Every one of these little holes you see is where that insect stuck his beak in that kernel and sucked the juice out. Rather unpleasant. Right now we don't have a single way established. We can't tell growers what do you do to go monitor to see if it's out there. There's no monitoring procedures. We don't have any thresholds for it. If you find one, what do you do besides get scared? Do I need to treat? Uh, we don't really know. Right now, cultural controls are the best thing we got. Deep tillage and irrigation, if you got it, half our peanut acres are not irrigated, so that's not an option for them. And then when we get down to chemical control, we got granular corpyrifos. This is be Lord's Band 15G. That's great, we've got something, but it doesn't work that great on burrow bug if you look at the data. I mean, it's not going to kill them all. It's not going to solve the problem. We need some more chemistry. We need to understand the insect better, but we need some new chemistry that will, will uh, have some efficacy against this insect because control is anything but consistent in the, the trials that I've seen. All right, so I'm going to wrap us up. We'll summarize here. If I look at peanuts as a whole, we've got some challenges for managing insects and peanuts. One of them is that there's lots and lots of insects out there that might eat peanuts but they tend to be sporadic and so for growers it's difficult to plan. As a scout, as a consultant, you need to be thinking about a lot of different things when you're in the field. You can't have your, your caterpillar blinders on or you're going to miss some other potential pest problems. Even more important than that, I think, is we don't have very many valid economic thresholds. This is something, again, that as the peanut entomology program, that's what we're going to work on over the next few years is try to figure out what these pests are doing to us and when we need to treat them. I would love to see us doing a whole lot more scouting and a whole lot less spraying caterpillars when we're not at threshold. You don't need to treat caterpillar populations when they're below threshold. Again, we're planning to do some work on three-cornered alfalfa hoppers starting. I got a graduate student coming down this spring and he's going to be working on coming up with some, ultimately, some economic thresholds for that insect. We continue to be on the lookout for burrower bugs, so if you find them in your county, uh, we'd very much like to hear about it and we would love to come out and uh, visit your farm and see what's going on there because we, we're very much interested in getting some information here in the state of Georgia, which we weren't able to do in 2013 due to the uh, conditions. Even though we don't have economic thresholds, people say, oh, I don't have a threshold, so why should I scout? Well, if you don't scout, you don't know what's there. Uh, you don't know what's, you may have some caterpillars, you don't know what species you have. You can make the wrong decision when it comes time to figure out what to spray. And I don't mean scouting by sitting on the sprayer when you're doing your fungicide application and looking down and saying, well, I, got, I can see some holes in the leaves, I got caterpillars I need to spray. I mean boots on the ground looking to see what's there. Because I think we can save ourselves some money if we'll look at these peanuts and stop spraying just because we can. Uh, and just to give you some motivation, there's some very potentially serious peanut pest in Georgia that we didn't see in 2013 because of the conditions that you might see in 2014 if it goes back to being a little bit drier. Lesser corn stalk borers, one of them. Burrow bugs and spider mites are two others. And of course, velvet bean caterpillar is a late season pest that can really jump on us and defoliate peanuts really quick. And if you're not in the field looking, that thing can get away from you really quick. So anyway, that's... Uh, that's all I've got. I would like to thank some folks, even though I've only been here for a very short period of time. I've had some really good interactions with the peanut growers here in Georgia, and the Georgia Peanut Commission and the National Peanut Board have been very supportive. And of course, the, uh, my, my group here at the University of Georgia 